Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We just finished studying the Gospel of Luke, and after some prayer, I feel like it makes the most sense to go right into the book of Acts, since the author of both books is the same, and the message is extremely needed in our day. Dr. Luke wrote more of the New Testament than any other author, including Paul. When you count word for word, Luke wins. That is, if Paul didn't write the book of Hebrews. Since I happen to believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, that means he wrote a little bit more of the New Testament than did Dr. Luke. Either way, Luke is extremely influential because he wrote somewhere around 24% of the New Testament. Most people don't realize this little piece of Bible trivia. Let's begin this study on Acts with an introduction into the basic information about the book and its author. In our next lesson, we will begin digging into the book itself. The common title of the book in Greek is The Acts of the Apostles, or the transactions of the apostles. That's interesting. Another Greek manuscript calls it the Acts of the Holy Apostles, but I'm not too crazy over that title because it sounds way too Catholic for me. Besides, not one of the apostles were Catholic or holy in and of themselves. Some ancient commentators have given the book some interesting titles. The one I like best is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And I think this is the most fitting of any of the titles because there are portions of the book of Acts that isn't about the apostles at all, but the entire book is about the work of the Holy Spirit in the primitive church. The ancient church father, Christom, gave Luke's work the title, The Demonstration of the Resurrection. That's a good title because the demonstration of Christ's resurrection is the church militant. The designation of the true church as the church militant is a very old way of referring to the people of God that are standing against the world and even hell itself to proclaim the kingdom of God throughout the world. The church militant has nothing to do with violence, rebellion, or insurrections. It's all about Christ's followers laying down their lives through the selfless love of God so that some might be saved, and we see this in the book of Acts. A few have even called the book the fifth gospel because the good news is taken throughout the known world and the door of salvation has been thrown wide open for the Gentiles to enter. Throughout this series, I will affectionately refer to Dr. Luke's wonderful work merely as Acts or the book of Acts. The author of the book is unanimously attributed to Dr. Luke beginning with the early church fathers. The I in the first verse is certainly a reference to Luke. And if we know that Luke wrote Acts, then we know that he wrote the gospel that bears his name as well. Paul called Luke the beloved physician in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Both Acts and the gospel of Luke came from the pen of a well-educated man that reveals an excellent mind and powerful communication skills, and this fits the character of Dr. Luke. The writing style of Acts is the same as that of Luke, and this further proves that both books were written by the same person. Yet nowhere in either book does the author mention himself, other than in what we term as the we statements, which are found in portions of the book of Acts. This reveals that the author was a genuinely humble man, and wasn't seeking fame or status through the writing of these historical books. Instead, the author focused in Acts on the ministry of the Holy Spirit working through those first saints and how the church grew under the Spirit's power and oversight. This is an extremely important point because the early church was built through the power of the Holy Spirit, which demonstrates that the church of all eras and locations should be built through the power of the Holy Spirit as well. To determine when Acts was written is relatively simple because of the internal evidence that gives us a general idea. Acts is dedicated to Theophilus, as is the Gospel of Luke, but the Gospel was written and distributed before Acts was written. Some scholars claim that 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 18 is a reference to Luke, and that his Gospel was already in great circulation by the time Paul wrote his second letter to the Corinthians. 
The verse reads, And we have sent with him, referring to Titus, the brother, whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. These scholars quote the early church father's Origen and Jerome to help support their claim. Origen, addressing the subject of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 18, stated, Luke wrote the gospel that was praised by Paul. This is how Origen, who lived between 184 and 253 AD, understood Paul's reference. And Jerome wrote, Luke, a physician from Antioch, indicated in his writings that he knew Greek and that he was a follower of the Apostle Paul and the companion of all his journeying. He wrote the gospel about which the same Paul says, We have sent with him a brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. The idea is that Luke had become famous for writing his gospel that had wide circulation. The implication of this is big, for it means that the Gospel of Luke was written at an earlier date rather than a later date, as many scholars assert. Paul already knew of Luke's Gospel, and the fame of it speaks of its wide distribution by Theophilus. That Luke dedicated both books to Theophilus tells us that Luke knew Theophilus well, but it doesn't mean that Luke and Acts had to be completed close to the same time, as some scholars claim. Since nothing is mentioned about the city of Rome being set on fire, which happened on July 19, 64 AD, so we can safely deduce that it was written before that date. The book of Acts closes with Paul's second year of imprisonment in Rome. Since nothing more is mentioned of Paul's imprisonment and execution, this would suggest that Acts was written somewhere around 62 to 63 AD. Luke mentions his arrival to Rome with Paul, and we see this in Acts chapter 28, verse 16. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Because Acts ends with Luke and Paul in Rome, where Paul was finally imprisoned and executed, it's reasonable to conclude that Acts was written in Rome before the death of Paul. The opening of Luke's Gospel states, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as it was handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. There were many who had written on the life, death, and resurrection of Messiah, and we have only four faithful narratives to this day. From what I stated earlier, Luke wrote his gospel before Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. By the time it was in wide distribution and the fame of Dr. Luke had grown, so it would have had to have been distributed years before Paul mentioned it. I give all the Gospels much earlier dates when they were written than is commonly suggested by scholars. The life of Christ and the way of salvation is far too important for it to take up to six decades for some of the Gospels to be written. Acts was written roughly 30 years after Jesus ascended into heaven, and this is an understandable time frame since the historical account is about the growth of the church and salvation coming to the Gentiles. Now let's take a look at Luke himself. We just don't know a lot about him since Luke didn't write about himself and others didn't write much about him either. He was one of the most accurate, articulate historians the world has ever known, and it would be good to know the author better if we could. The high quality of the writing style and the faultless credibility of his geographical references makes his accounts all the more real, convincing, and believable. He was a historian that can be trusted because he wasn't trying to rewrite history to promote a selfish agenda, as is happening with textbooks for our public schools and institutions of higher learning today. His accuracy has silenced critics again and again as facts that he wrote about are proven to be true by unearthing ancient archaeological sites. So what else can we know about the author? We know from his writing style that he had an excellent knowledge of the Greek language. At times he wrote in a high formal style of classical Greek that's equal in quality to some of the greatest ancient Greek authors. We see this in his formal introductions to the gospel in the book of Acts. At other times, his Greek is in a more common Semitic style that was popular in the days of Jesus. This is interesting because it points to Jewish roots rather than his being a Greek Gentile that wouldn't have written in a Jewish style of Greek. Luke's writing is more like an investigative reporter extraordinaire. 
His accuracy in geography is astounding, and his use of proper titles of people shows his grasp of both the Roman and Jewish cultures. His knowledge of the sea is also extensive. All this proves that Luke was not only well-educated, but he had a powerful mind that could process the information he accumulated and then communicate that knowledge in a very rare, understandable way. This is a rare gift and reveals that he was an excellent communicator, at least on paper, as is the case with many scholars. As I've already mentioned, Luke was a companion of Paul who called him a fellow laborer, and we find this in Philemon chapter 1, verse 24. He traveled much with Paul and was a fellow laborer in spreading the gospel through many of Paul's hardships, including his imprisonments in Rome. Some authors and commentators speculate that Luke was a Macedonian Paul saw in a vision recorded in Acts chapter 16, but there's no substance to such a claim. It appears from Acts chapter 17 that Paul left Luke in Philippi when Paul and Silas had to flee the city because some of the people were seeking to kill him. This tells us that Luke wasn't on Paul's second missionary journey, as we also know from the absence of the we statements during Paul's second missionary trip. We know that Luke was once again united with Paul for his third missionary journey because we find in Acts chapter 20, verse 6, once again, the we statements. The verse reads, But we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and five days later joined others at Taurus, where we stayed seven days. Luke was with Paul when he journeyed to Jerusalem and was also with him when he was in prison in Rome, as I stated earlier. From all this, we see a man that was profoundly dedicated to Jesus and was a faithful laborer with Paul. When others forsook Paul, such as Demas, who backslid because he loved this world, Luke stayed with him as a faithful brother in Christ and labor for the glory of God. Now let's get into the controversy that revolves around Luke, but which is for the most part ignored, and I briefly spoke on this during the lesson where I studied in Luke's Gospel, where Jesus walked with two disciples after his resurrection. The controversy is over whether Luke was a Jew or Gentile. No matter what our view is on the matter, how this question is answered won't alter a single Bible doctrine or put the credibility of Luke's writings into question. For this reason, the issue of Luke's heritage and nationality could be ignored and nothing would change. Even though knowing Luke's identity isn't imperative to accepting the accuracy and credibility of his historical works, as students of the Bible, we should want to know who the author is and see how this influenced his writing. Those who claim that Luke was a Gentile teach as if there wasn't any doubt over the matter, but there is, and some big doubts as well. It seems like so many people are just parroting what others have said about Luke being a Gentile and not digging into what the Word of God teaches on the subject. In the end, we can't say for certain whether Luke was a Jew or a Gentile, but in my opinion, the circumstantial evidence is strongly in favor that he was a Jew. If you scan the internet in search of finding Luke's nationality, most websites and blogs are just copycats of what others have already said, since there doesn't seem to be much scholarly research on the subject. Now, according to the Bible and salvation history, mankind is divided into two people groups, Jews, who are actual descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and non-Jews, who are referred to as Gentiles. Jews make up a small portion of mankind, while Gentiles make up the rest of humanity. The Jews were given the distinction to be the people God chose to reveal himself through so that the world may come to saving faith in Christ. The Savior of the world came through the bloodline of descendants of the Jewish patriarchs, yet he died for the sins of mankind on a whole and not only for the Jewish people. Those who claim that Luke was a Gentile have only one portion of Scripture to support their claim, which is Colossians chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. And I will read these verses to you. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proven a comfort to me. 
Ephraim, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is also wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Heropolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. In verses 10 and 11, there are three people that are said to be the only Jews that were among Paul's fellow laborers. The original Greek calls them the circumcision, but other translations designate them as Jews so that more people would understand who Paul is writing about. We know from these verses that Aristarchus, Mark, and Justus were Jewish followers of Messiah, and it appears that they were also preachers like Paul, which is something we are never told that Luke did. Luke isn't mentioned until three verses later, and he is never mentioned as a preacher, though some referred to him as an evangelist because of the gospel that he wrote. It appears that part of Luke's responsibility to Paul was to be his personal physician and friend. It's interesting to note that there isn't a single verse that declares that Luke was a Gentile or that he was a Jew for that matter. Since he wasn't a preacher, it wouldn't have been appropriate to have him included in the list of Jewish preachers. Since Luke isn't mentioned in the list of co-labors that were of the circumcision, many deduce that Luke and Demas were Gentiles. Yet there were many Jewish followers of Messiah in Colossae at that time who didn't abandon Paul or their faith in Christ. They didn't make Paul's short list since they weren't preachers of the gospel or of enough prominence that they needed to be mentioned. If only three in Colossae became followers of Messiah under Paul's ministry, then he wasn't the effective missionary that we thought he was. From Paul's ministry style, it's reasonable to say that he probably won many Jews of the promised Messiah from Colossae, Laodicea, and Heropolis. When you combine all of this together, the claim that Luke was a Gentile is built upon extremely weak evidence. Another reason those who claim Luke was a Gentile is because his name is Greek, which is a very poor argument that has absolutely no substance to stand upon. We commonly use Paul's Greek name rather than his Jewish name, which is Saul. Peter is the Greek name for Simon, and this is how Jesus predominantly referred to him. Philip and Andrew are two of the original 12 apostles that had Greek names. When Jesus walked with two disciples on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, the only man identified had the Greek name of Cleopas. It's humorous to note that those who claim Luke was a Gentile because he had a Greek name missed the point that the three names Paul mentioned that were Jewish preachers all had Greek names as well. Most Jews that lived among the Gentiles or did business with them had a Greek or Gentile name besides their Jewish name. The claim that Luke was a Gentile because he had a Greek name is absolutely worthless. Some scholars have made the ridiculous claim that since Luke was a physician, he was a Gentile, which is to say that there were no Jewish doctors in Israel in that day. There's absolutely no substance to such a claim, though. Even Jesus referred to physicians in Luke chapter 4, verse 23, Physician, heal thyself, and Matthew chapter 9, verse 12. We see from this that there were Jewish doctors in Israel in Jesus' day and in the book of Acts as well. The strongest argument, those who claim that Luke was a Gentile, comes from extra-biblical evidence. Some early church fathers claimed that Luke was a Gentile, the earliest being roughly 100 years after Luke wrote his historical books. I don't want to downplay the importance of the early church fathers because they shed a lot of light on our faith, and I earlier quoted two to support a point I was making. Some early church fathers made the claim that Luke was a Greek from Antioch, which is in ancient Syria, and it may be that Luke was from Antioch. The earliest accounts stated in very ambiguous terms that Luke probably was originally a convert through Peter, who became a disciple of Paul and followed him until Paul's martyrdom. The vague way that this early writer wrote on Luke makes it hard to accept it as historically accurate, or even that he is a Gentile. I think the claim of a couple early church fathers that wrote in such indefinite terms doesn't hold much water. The first support of Luke being a Jew is from the claim of Scripture itself, which is very important. 
We are told by Paul in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, What advantage, then, is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. Paul is making this argument because in Romans chapter 1, he proved that all Gentiles are sinners, and then in chapter 2, that all Jews are sinners. So at the beginning of chapter 3, he is basically asking, what advantage is there to being a Jew over that of a Gentile, since both are sinners under divine wrath? His response is important as it relates to the identity of Luke. The Jews were the ones God entrusted with the very words of God, and this would include both Old and New Testaments. God's self-disclosure came to the Jews, and then through the Jews to the rest of the world. And Paul wrote on this and must have known that Luke was a Jew. To say that Luke is a Gentile is to say that God broke his own rule, and this is something I just can't agree with. It also says that Paul lied in what he wrote in Romans. It's to make the claim that God entrusted the Old Testament to the Jews and only three-quarters of the New Testament to them, while the rest of the New Testament was entrusted to a Gentile. The Jewish people were the vehicle God chose to make himself known to the world, and he did this according to his will and wisdom. Now, if Luke is the exception of this rule, then those who claim Luke was a Gentile must prove by Scripture that God has broken his own rule or made a new one. But such a verse or verses don't exist in Scripture. If God is immutable, which means that he cannot change, then it would mean that God did change in this matter. And if God is changeable, then the God of the Bible isn't the true and living God. And this is a very serious issue now. If the Lord is the Logos of God, the truth made flesh, and if it's true that God can't lie or change, then he certainly isn't lying or bending the rules to allow a Gentile to be numbered among the authors of the Bible. Another very powerful reason that supports the claim that Luke was Jewish comes out of Paul's arrest in Jerusalem, and the account is found in Acts chapter 21. Some Jews from Asia recognized Paul when he was in the temple and stirred up the people by falsely accusing him that he brought Gentiles into the temple. The justification for their actions is stated in Acts chapter 21, verse 29. They had recently seen Trophimus, an Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple area. Luke accompanied Paul on his trip to Jerusalem. And if he was a Gentile, then they would have stirred up the people stating that Luke was unlawfully in the temple as well. The serious nature of this crime is that it is punishable by death. Luke had made several trips with Paul to Jerusalem, and there was never any trouble that arose, and this gives strong evidence that Luke was a Jew by birth. Another point that supports the claim that Luke was Jewish is the extensive knowledge he has of the Jewish temple that's greater than any other gospel writer. With the prophecy about the birth of John the Baptist, Luke gives considerable detail into the rotation of the priests and Levites that was established under King David. He clearly described the altar of incense where Zechariah was making his offering as a priest. This shows his extensive knowledge of the Jewish faith and the temple worship rituals. Gentiles were forbidden to go into the temple and to do so incurred the death penalty. For a devout Jew to have such knowledge of the temple worship and the sacrificial system is reasonable to believe, rather than it being the work of a Gentile, that wouldn't understand the way Jewish people thought. I want to add here a point I mentioned earlier in how Luke's writing style goes from classical Greek to the common style of Greek that was used by the majority of Jews living in Israel during that day. Writing in the common Jewish man's Greek speaks powerfully of his being Jewish rather than it being the work of a Gentile that was trying to sound Jewish. Then you have Luke's intimate acquaintance with Mary, the mother of Jesus, which comes out in his gospel. He tells the story from Mary's perspective, which strongly implies that he must have spent some time with her. Twice he recorded in Luke chapter 2 that Mary hid these things in her heart, And this isn't something that would be mentioned to a casual contact. It's reasonable to think that the Apostle John, who was entrusted by Jesus from the cross to care for his earthly mother, would make sure she was well protected from any hostile sources. 
there were the distinct possibilities of repercussions from the religious powers that hated Jesus and from Roman authorities that had been duped by the Pharisees and Sanhedrin council concerning him. Mary would have been in the inner circle of the primitive church, not in the sense of leadership, but from the powerful testimony she had about Jesus, which was unique out of all of Christ's followers. The early church was a close-knit community of faith, both because of the first-hand knowledge they had about Messiah and because they were persecuted. Given the level of respect and protection Mary would have been given, how could Luke get close to her if he wasn't a Jew that wasn't granted access to her? With all this evidence, I think that Luke was a Jew, not a Gentile. It may be that he was a Hellenistic Jew, which means that he was a Jew that was raised in a Gentile nation, spoke Greek, and was given a Greek name. This may be a possible explanation for his being educated as a doctor, perhaps in a Gentile school. Another possibility is that one of Luke's parents could have been Gentile and the other a Jew, and this would have allowed Luke to claim his Jewish heritage. In this way, he would have been considered a Jew, but may have been raised in a Gentile culture. It's just my opinion, but I think there's a possibility that the disciple that wasn't named who walked with Jesus on the Maus Road could be Luke. Given the humble character that he displays in his writings and the effort to keep the attention of his readers fixed upon Jesus caused me to wonder if the reason why the other disciple wasn't named was to hide the identity of the author. That's just speculation, though. Nothing more. Now let's look into a very simple outline of the book of Acts. It begins with chapters 1 and 2, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and this is fitting for the entire book to begin this way. This is where the disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit as Jesus promised, and the initial evidence was that they spoke in tongues. This is still the case today when people are baptized in the Holy Spirit. From this outpouring of the Spirit, a crowd was drawn together where Peter preached under the power of the Holy Spirit, and 3,000 were saved from that sermon. From the end of chapter 2 through chapter 6, we get an honest glimpse of the life of the infant church in Israel, and more specifically, the church in Jerusalem. Here we have the first recorded account of persecution and the church's bold response through prayer and evangelism. In chapter 7 and 8, we meet Stephen, one of the first deacons of the primitive church, who had the testimony by God that he was a man full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, wisdom, grace, and power. That's a pretty awesome testimony, and especially since it came from God himself. Stephen's martyrdom opened the door of persecution that caused many believers to flee Jerusalem and even Israel. The Lord used this to begin spreading the church throughout the Roman Empire in a greater way. But even then, it stayed within the Jewish culture that had spread throughout many parts of the Roman Empire. In chapter 9, we get to read about Saul's radical conversion and how it didn't take long before the man who was hunting down Christians to either imprison or kill them was himself being hunted down to be killed. Chapters 10 and 11 are extremely important because they are about how the Lord opened the door for Gentiles to come to Christ without having to first convert to Judaism. Peter was the apostle the Lord used to bring this about because it didn't take long before the primitive church had become a closed community. To a certain extent, this was necessary so that the Jewish church could be firmly established before she began reaching the multitudes of unsaved Gentiles. Chapter 12 is about King Agrippa's persecution of the church and the miserable death that he suffered. Chapters 13 and 14 are about Paul's first missionary journey beginning in Antioch going through Asia Minor, and then returning to Antioch. Paul's missionary companion in this first trip was Barnabas. Chapter 15 is about Paul's trip to Jerusalem and the council that was held about Paul's work among the Gentiles. Chapter 16 through 18 is on Paul's second missionary journey, and this time he brought with him Silas, not Barnabas. Then in chapters 18 through 20, Paul takes his third missionary journey. Paul takes his final trip to Jerusalem in chapters 21 through 23, and this is where he is arrested. The final section is chapters 24 through 28, which is about Paul's trip to Rome as a prisoner and his imprisonment in Rome. In our next lesson, we will begin digging into Acts chapter 1. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. 
Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. Thirst no more, so come wash in the river, come drink your fill, let healing waters bear away your gift.